Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you all this morning. Thank you to Billy for playing as we gather. Uh, in God's name, I give you a warm welcome to our service this morning, whether you're here in person or whether you're joining us online later on. Uh, it's good to see you all here together. Uh, I have quite a number of announcements that, that I'd like to draw to your attention this morning. And in your order of service, you'll see the uh, services for the rest of the month. Philip next week, myself the following week, and then Philip again. Uh, our treasurer, Roy, would uh, remind you that the maintenance of property appeal applies this month. Uh, and I'll be saying something more about the Ukrainian crisis in a moment or two. Uh, can I remember members of remind members of Kirk's session uh, that we have a meeting at 7.30 in the halls on Tuesday evening, that's Tuesday the 8th this week at 7.30 and we'll be considering the arrangements uh, for COVID and the restrictions that are being reduced. Uh, the coffee and chat round in 3.09 will be on this Wednesday at 2.30 and you're all welcome to that and uh, they'll be dealing with the uh, Belfast City Council recycling and someone will be there to tell us a bit more about that. Uh, can I mention to you that uh, Wider World magazines are available. Uh, thank you to Peggy for that. And the Wider World magazines are available in the porch today, along with the Presbyterian Herald and the Prayer Diary for March. <clears throat> also, there's a meeting about the Rosemary Lunch Club hoping to get that back up and running again at some stage in some way. And so there's a meeting on Tuesday at 10.30 a.m. and that's in the hall. So that's Tuesday morning, the 8th of March, a meeting for the lunch club. And uh, can I draw your attention then to the stamp appeal? Uh, now I'd like to take a moment or two of your time uh, to share with you uh, the moderator's appeal uh, for the crisis in Ukraine. Uh, we are all uh, stunned uh, by the, the worsening crisis in Ukraine. And people have been asking me about what should we do? Can we bring things anywhere? Can we send help? And there is a great upwelling of concern uh, for the people in Ukraine at this horrible time. So let me share with you just a few slides and a message from our moderator uh, to show uh, and explain how the Presbyterian Church is responding to this appeal, and perhaps you would like to be part of that. First of all, in response to the ongoing devastating war in Ukraine and the exodus of people from that country, the moderator of the Presbyterian Church, Dr. Bruce, uh, has launched an appeal towards the emergency relief effort to help people in Ukraine and also those that are refugees and fleeing from the conflict. Um, the moderator writes that in calling to, upon all PCI members to consider their response to the humanitarian emergency, Dr. Bruce has said, further to my letter last week calling for congregations to pray for the situation in Ukraine, tragically the bombardment of Ukraine and its people by President Putin's forces has continued, and the fear and suffering of the people living in that country has increased day by day. The United Nations estimates that more than a million people have fled the country already due to the war, uh, and many more are expected to follow in the coming days. The moderator has launched a special appeal towards the emergency relief effort to help people in Ukraine and those fleeing from the conflict. Uh, the Presbyterian Church in Ireland has immediately released 60,000 uh, pounds to be distributed towards the relief appeal. And that is going to the development partners, Christian Aid and Tear Fund, and also to, uh, who is also a global mission partner, and to the Reformed Church in Hungary the Hungarian Reformed Church. They are all experienced in supplying and distributing humanitarian aid and assistance, not least to refugees and displaced persons fleeing from conflicts in the region. And whenever possible, they will extend their reach into the country of Ukraine itself. Uh, can I say a word or two about the Hungarian Reformed Church? 
that church was amongst the first organizations to mobilize its staff and volunteers to provide immediate assistance. The charity organization of the Hungarian Reformed Church uh, delivered the first food packages to the Ukrainian-Hungarian border on Thursday morning, the 24th of February, whenever the Russian forces entered and invaded. And it has already sent more than 10 tons of non-perishable food worth around, around 22,000 euros across the borders in the last couple of days. This is ongoing. They have also been welcoming people fleeing from the war on train stations uh, at the border, distributing food, tea, drinking water, providing interpretation services and assistance in transport to see them to public transport hubs and onward. In conjunction with the Hungarian trans, uh, Reformed Church, uh, the Bethsaida Hospital, uh, they are also providing medical assistance to those people uh, arriving in Hungary and also sending medical supplies uh, into Transcarpathia in, in Ukraine. Christian Aid, Ireland and Tear Fund are working with a range of partners on the, grounds, on the ground and in the neighboring countries and hope to work inside Ukraine as soon as circumstances allow it. Their partners are providing for the immediate needs uh, of the huge numbers of people fleeing Ukraine every hour. They are working around the clock providing things such as food, bedding and temporary accommodation for the people. In recent days, one of the local partners has distributed 28 tons of food supplies and other life-saving essentials uh, to displaced people across Ukraine. For our information, 30 pounds would be enough to provide essential hygiene supplies for three people for one month. 50 pounds would provide blankets for four, for four families. 100 pounds could provide emergency food for two families for one month. Every little helps. And finally then, two slides about the, what we should be praying for. And we will have this up uh, on the website, uh, on the Facebook site as well. Pray for immediate ceasefire and an end to the war. Pray too for the de-escalation of the tensions between East and West, between Russia and the Western countries. Pray for all affected by the war, especially the grieving, the injured, and those whose homes have been destroyed. Pray for people uh, sheltering in fear, those fighting for freedom, and those protesting for peace. Pray for the large Christian community in Ukraine. Pray that they will know that God is with them, and that he is their strength and refuge and hope. Pray, too, that they will be a witness to others in these days of distress and fear. And finally, pray for those who have recently fled or are fleeing due to the war in Ukraine and have been displaced from within the country. Pray that they will find safety, shelter, water, food, and medical help. Pray that they will receive both emergency humanitarian aid as well as help in the coming weeks and months. Pray for the aid agencies and the governments trying to bring humanitarian aid to refugees and people living in Ukraine, particularly those that we are working for with Christian Aid, Tear Fund and the, Human the Hungarian Reformed Church. So I commend to you this need. If you want to make a donation to the moderator's appeal, uh, it can be done from today onward. Just put it in an envelope, Market Ukraine, and if you are a free will offering a taxpayer, uh, put your number on it, and that means that we'll be able to get the gift aid on it. Is that right, Roy? So just put it in, in the box at the end, uh, uh, leave it here, give it to Roy, give it to me, and we will see that it gets through. Uh, these are important and scary times. Now we turn to this morning. I want to welcome Michael. It's good to have you back in, in Rosemary, Michael. It's good to have you here. Uh, Michael is part of the team in Carn Money, uh, where Philip is this morning, and Michael is the discipleship associate. Uh, and we're very glad to have you. And can I say that we wish you well in the days ahead as God leads you forward in your ministry. Good to have you.
Good morning, everyone. Good to be back with you in Rosemary this morning. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I want to thank Trevor for his welcome and for uh, giving us the update on, on the moderator's appeal. I want to say, too, that on behalf of Carmoney Church, we deeply appreciate you sharing Philip with us. This has been a longer journey than any of us anticipated, uh, and Philip has been a real blessing to us in leadership and in, in the congregation. He's been deeply encouraging, he's been a stabilizing influence, and he's brought leadership when we have felt the absence of, of John Dickinson and, and felt the absence of a minister. Uh, personally, I have really enjoyed working with Philip, and he, he's been really a blessing and an encouragement to me. So just want to communicate that we appreciate you sharing him with us. Let's take a moment to pray as we begin our worship this morning. Let's pray. Eternal God, we call to mind that there is no shadow of turning with you. We come to you this morning and realize that your word tells us you're the one who, who lifts his voice and the earth melts. You created the starry host. You call them and number them. Not one star escapes your view or attention. You are high and holy. And yet it delights you to be with the people that you have made. You draw near by your spirit to bring hope and comfort, to strengthen and encourage. None compares to you. Isaiah tells us that you bring princes and rulers to nothing. It's to you that we come to worship this morning. We turn our attention and our thoughts to you, knowing that you're the one who provides life and health and hope and strength when we feel weak. We ask, Lord God, that the presence of Jesus would be real among us this morning, that we would know his help that we would know his attention on our lives, that we would find in him the forgiveness for our sins that we desperately need and the acceptance that we will never find elsewhere. Minister to our fears, we ask. Direct our hearts to worship you and fill us with hope through your word. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Okay, let's stand together as we sing Jesus is Lord.
We're going to turn to God's Word now. We're going to read together from Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 32 to 38. You'll maybe know that Nehemiah was burdened when he heard the situation in Jerusalem. He had been in exile, never actually been to Jerusalem before, but heard about Jerusalem, and it it stirred his heart that the city lay in ruins, and it, it unsettled him, and he wanted Uh, God put it in his heart to go back there and to restore the place where God's glory dwelled and where God's people dwelled. And uh, there had been a return from exile from some people, some of God's people, Israel, but but Nehemiah had had stayed. uh, And eventually he hears a report and he decides to go back and the walls are rebuilt in in record time. There's a a renewal project going on. uh, And while things start to become a little bit more prosperous, then the people forget God, as we typically do. We experience material success or, or security, and we think we're okay. We can live life without God, and there's arrogance and a rejection of God, and this cycle continues. And in Nehemiah chapter 9, the whole chapter is a real, uh, it's a summary of Old Testament history, really. Uh, it's a prayer of confession. It's a, it's a prayer of acknowledgement of who God is and who we are as his people. And then this is just the final section of that prayer, and the words will be, on the screen. Verse 32. Now therefore, O God, now therefore, O our God, the great, mighty, and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love, do not let all this hardship seem trifling in your eyes, the hardship that has come upon us, upon our kings and leaders, upon our priests and prophets, upon our fathers and all your people from the days of the king of Assyria until today. In all that has happened to us, you have been just. You have acted faithfully while we did wrong. Our kings and our leaders and our priests and our fathers did not follow your law. They did not pay attention to your commands or the warnings you gave them. Even while they were in their kingdom, enjoying your great goodness to them in the spacious and fertile land you gave them, they did not serve you or turn from their evil ways. But see, we are slaves today in the land you gave our forefathers so that they could eat its fruit and other good things it produces because of our sins and its abundant harvest goes to the kings that you have placed over us. They rule over our bodies and our cattle as they please. We are in great distress. In view of all this, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing, and our leaders and our Levites and our priests are affixing their seals to it. We end there giving thanks to God for his word to us today. Sorry, if you were if you were following along there on the screen, I was reading the text and not thinking about the screen. I'm going to take a moment just, just to pray, and obviously Trevor's been reminding us of the, the needs that are constantly before us on our television screen, the situation in Ukraine, and we will pray about that and bring that situation before God corporately this morning. We'll also pray for our own city. There are challenges politically. There there are challenges with crime even close by. And we'll pray for for this particular area of North Belfast and ask that God would be uh, with us as we seek to be a witness to him in this area. And, And we'll also pray for those who need to experience the comfort of God as they deal with grief and sadness at this time. So why don't you join me in prayer? Let us pray. Lord God, we believe that you're the God who sees all things. You're the God who knows all things. Before a word is on our tongue, you know it completely. And yet, you delight to hear our prayers. We come before you this morning so conscious of our own weakness. We feel powerless in the face of all that is going on in our world. We wonder what can we do in order to effect change in this distressing situation between Ukraine and Russia and the surrounding nations. We read that one and a half million people have fled Ukraine to neighboring countries. What must it be like to be separated from family, to be far from home, to be in a strange place, and to be conscious that those whom we love 
may still be in the place where we've left, whose lives are at risk, and the country is in turmoil. We find it difficult to get our heads around what our brothers and sisters in Ukraine are experiencing. And yet, Lord God, we believe that Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, your Son, is familiar with exile. He knows what it's like to be a refugee fleeing for safety to Egypt. He really is familiar with all our ways. And so we bring this situation to you, Lord Jesus, knowing that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our weakness, one who is able to sympathize with us in everything. He was tempted just as we are yet without sin. And so we bring the situation in Ukraine before you, asking, Lord God, in your mercy, you would bring about a resolution, that you would bring an end to the conflict, that there would be peace, and that you would protect those who are most vulnerable in this situation. As we think of President Putin, we believe your word when it tells us the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. We, pl we pray, Lord God, that you would turn the heart of Putin to yourself, that he would repent, that he, his plans and purposes would be frustrated, that he would be humbled, and we believe that you are able. We ask in, in your mercy that you would bring war to an end, that it would cease, that there would be no more conflict. We pray for those who are injured and afraid. We pray that they would know your presence and your care. And we think too of your church in, in Ukraine and in Russia, the people who, who love you, who want to see your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we ask that you would enable them to continue to trust you, even though life is unfolding in a way that they would never choose. Help them to continue to be conscious of your presence, to believe your promises, to gather as your people and to feel unity in your church. We believe that one day, Every nation, tribe, and tongue will, will bow the knee to Jesus. And so we pray that our, in our own place, that national pride, that loyalty and allegiance would ultimately be to your kingdom, to seek first the kingdom of God. And all these other things would be added onto us. We pray, Lord God, that you would help us to bring about peace, not only here on our doorstep, but also right across the world, that you would help us to do whatever we can in order to alleviate the suffering right around the world and that we would play our part in representing you in this conflict. As we think of Ukraine and, and Russia, we also think of our own locality and we think of those who have been the victims of violence over many years, those who still live with the trauma of that. And we ask that you would comfort them, that you would give them peace, enable them to rest and to feel secure. We think especially of the shop workers who have been working in, uh, perhaps even on the Old Park Road this week where there was a, a knife crime incident. A shop was robbed. We think of the employees of that place and ask that you would be with them as they try to deal with that and come to terms with that, that you'd be with the PSNI as they work to uh, bring about justice for that incident and other incidents right across our city. We pray, Lord God, that you would help us to be people who represent you well in the city that you've called us to live in. Finally, Lord God, we, we pray for your church and we remember this morning those who grieve. We pray that they would be comforted in their loss and experience the strength that you alone supply in our weakness. May you penetrate the darkness of grief with the light of Jesus Christ, with the hope of eternal life. We pray, Lord God, that you would minister to us through your word, that you would unite us as your people this morning, and that while we live in fragile times where we feel our own fragility, that, that we would know that you are faithful, that you are good, that you would equip us for the week ahead and help us to have confidence in your good purposes, for it's in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing, There is a Redeemer. Let's stand.
I really love that hymn. I, I love singing it. And uh, very often in situations that I find myself in where people are telling me about difficulties that they've encountered, maybe they've experienced loss. And humanly speaking, there's, there's no way to comfort them. There's nothing that we can say. There's no guarantee that things are going to get better. It, it is possible just to end the message or end the conversation by saying, there is a Redeemer. I love to be able to, to bring those words of comfort to people who have experienced loss, to be able to say, I don't know how this all works out, but we believe that there is, there is a Redeemer. Great, great words to be reminded of. On the 19th of January, BBC News reported that a Londonderry shop owner, Mr. Jim Barr, received a card with an apology from an anonymous person who confessed to stealing £10 from him 30 years ago. The customer said he'd given the shop owner a £20 note when in fact it was only a tenner. Mr. Barr said, I'm guessing they were about 12 or 13 at the time, so they're probably in their 40s now. This must have been playing on their conscience for years. Most people are good deep down, he said. You get the odd bad apple, but the way I look at it is that person may have had a hard life, and it's probably just the way they were brought up. You can barely get a dairy journal around here today because so many people have been going out to read the story. It's been lovely to hear these messages from people, and some of them I don't even know, saying nice things about me. Maybe with all the doom and gloom of January, People just like to hear a good news story. So, what do you need doing up to? What's happened in your past that haunts you or terrifies you? What would cause you to blush or go into hiding if it was discovered? You maybe know the story about the practical joke that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle played on, on his friends, 12 of his friends, you know, the author of the Sherlock Holmes mysteries. He sent them a telegram uh, now, these men were all well-respected, men of virtue, well-respected in their uh, field and, and well-known. And he sent them a telegram that simply said, flee, all has been discovered. The story goes that within the next 24 hours, all 12 men had left the country. <laughs> in Nehemiah chapter 9, we read a, a confession letter. Rather than running from God in shame about how they had lived and how Israel had rejected God and abandoned God. The Levites of Nehemiah's time go back over it in prayer. It's the fullest review of the biblical story in the whole of the Old Testament. And in that chapter, if you get a chance to read it, you'll see an account of creation, Exodus, the Red Sea, the wilderness, the commandments, the golden calf, all of that. It's all spoken about in, in Nehemiah chapter 9. It took a quarter of a day to confess their sin. And then they spent another quarter of the day worshiping God. You'll, you'll be checking your watch if I go five minutes over my time. Never mind a quarter of a day worshiping, a quarter of a day in prayer. There's no airbrushing, there's no filtering. The story of the people of God is told in Nehemiah chapter 9, warts and all. It's an unflattering photograph. Maybe if you go back through your family album, you can see photographs when your clothes were, you know, something that you would laugh at now. Or your hairstyle is something that you would uh, be embarrassed about. Or maybe you look at the wallpaper behind, uh, behind what's going on in the photograph and you think, oh my goodness, do you remember we had that wallpaper? Or do you remember we had those curtains? Do you remember that sofa? Do you remember the pattern in that carpet and, and, and you're embarrassed about it and people might even make fun of you, your children might make fun of you as they look back at these, these photographs and they're, they're embarrassed about the taste that they used to have. Well, here, God's people actually bring it up to God, the, the embarrassing parts of their lives, and they say, this is us. This is who we are. This is the embarrassing truth about how we have rejected your word. The cycle of disobedience could be written of every generation since the fall, because as Paul tells the Romans in chapter 3, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We could say it too. There are embarrassing aspects of our life that we need to bring before God. This is a, a prayer about, first of all, being human, being human. People say to us, don't they, 
sure, you're only human. And it's an acknowledgement of the fact that we are limited. And we say when we make a mistake, ah, sure, I'm only human. Because we want people to cut us a bit of slack. We want to be able to say, I'm not perfect. It's a confession of weakness. And in Nehemiah chapter 9, this prayer disagrees with Mr. Jim Barr's assessment that most people are good deep down. Because the biblical reality is that is not true. In verse 33, we read the words, we have acted wickedly. A summary of the book of Nehemiah uh, covers a whole lot of ground. It's like a, a builder's merchant's um, log book or record book because there's, there's stuff in there about building materials. It's like a teacher's rule book because there's a list of names. It's, it's, there's prophetic words in there. It's like a history book. It recounts what's going on in the past. There's a whole lot of stuff going on. God's people are back in Jerusalem where they belong, but things are not as they should be. Yeah, the, the temple and the city was in ruins, and yet the walls have been rebuilt. And Nehemiah was really distressed when he heard about how things were. And he, he as, as a governor, felt, I can do something about this. And King Artaxerxes, a foreign king, a pagan king, bankrolled the building project. The renewal project's gone well. They've experienced material and physical prosperity. But as a result, God's people neglected God's word and they neglected worship of him. And unsurprisingly, the consequences of their actions ended up in slavery, injustice, and oppression. God was disciplining them through foreign rulers. Pagan powers were actually making life difficult for God's people. In spite of the prosperity, things were not as they should be in the homeland. And their response in worship is really, really refreshing. They don't blame it on the odd bad apple. They don't say, well, we would have been good, but we've been led astray by other people. It's other people's fault. They, they engage in a collective confession, public confession of their own failure, past and present. They say things like, our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. They stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to slavery in Egypt. They say, this is who we are. This is our history. Our ancestors behaved poorly, and we are repeating the same sins that they, they did. We're just like them. They own up to their own failures in prayer. And the Israelites in Nehemiah's day seem to have an honest grasp of, of who they are. And you think, why would you do that? Why would you go before God and tell him the worst bits of your life? Why would you bring up in conversation the embarrassing, humbling aspects of who you really are? Why would you do that? Why would you dredge up the past? What good would it be to do that? Would you not be better at making excuses for yourself? Do you know, like, when you take a child to a supermarket, so I've had this experience as a parent of, a, of young children, uh, and when they throw a tantrum in the supermarket, or just as you come to the checkout, and you feel like you need to explain that this is not a regular occurrence, and this is like the first time they've ever cried, <laughs> or, or the first time they've ever disagreed with you, and you say, Oh, the, you're tired. <laughs> I was really tired. I didn't get much sleep last night. And you try and make an excuse. Or, oh, you're hungry, mister. You'll be, going, you'll be getting your lunch soon. Because you try and make an excuse to say, the reason why this behavior is bad is because of these extenuating circumstances. They're not just, you know, demon-possessed <laughs> or evil. You want to try and play it down. You make excuses. You try and explain it away. Oh, he's maybe got a tooth coming through. We, we try and give a reason or excuse to, to uh, almost justify the behavior. We make excuses for bad behavior, but there's no attempt in Nehemiah chapter 9 for God's people to say, we're bad, but it's someone else's fault, or we're, we're behaving poorly, but we didn't get much sleep, or we've got a lot of work going on at the minute, we're really busy, so it justifies me snapping at you because of actually got a lot in, he's got a lot on his plate. You need to give him a bit of space. The reason that they don't 
try to justify themselves or make excuses for their bad behavior is because they know who they're speaking to. Verse 17 says, you're a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. They knew that God didn't forsake their ancestors when they sinned, so he wouldn't forsake them either. They knew that God was a a God who loved to show mercy, a God who loved to show compassion, a God who loved to forgive sinners. In a book I read last year, the author speaks of God's interaction with humans in the following way. Given their sinfulness, they're shocked to find that their sins cause him to be all the more ready to plunge them into his heart. They unexpectedly find him with open arms to embrace them, ready forever to forget all their sins as though they had never been. God's people knew that he was forgiving, gracious, kind. We forget it and we run from him. But when we know that he is forgiving, we run to him. And that was the case in Nehemiah's day. I was taught to, to understand the word justified, maybe the same for you. you how, how do you know what justified means theologically? It means just as if I'd never sinned or just as if I'd always obeyed, justified. And I'm justified through Jesus. He's the one who makes me right with God because he takes the punishment for my sin. He, he serves the time so that I can go free. He's the one who, though my sins are scarlet, makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so the best thing to do is to expose all the sin to the one who makes you clean, to the one who paid it all, the one who is going to pay your debt. You don't want to hide some of that debt. You want to expose that debt so that it will be totally covered. You say, this is who I am. This is the worst of me, and I need you to deal with it. Like, you don't take your car to the car wash and stand in front of the muddiest part so that you're, you know, embarrassed at the person who's washing your car. You say, here's my car. It's absolutely filthy. Can you please make it clean? And we do the same before God because he's the one who can make us clean. In verse 26, we read these words. Look at the mess our ancestors have made of things. They cast your law behind their backs. They killed your prophets, ignored your warnings, committed great blasphemies. And they're able to do this. They're able to expose the worst of themselves because they know who God is. They know who they're talking to. Elise Fitzpatrick says this, the benefits of God's grace never depended on the faithfulness of human beings. It's liberating, isn't it, this morning? The benefits of God's grace never depended on the faithfulness of human beings. You can experience grace this morning even if you've been unfaithful. Even if you don't feel up to it. Even if you came in to worship this morning thinking, I I don't feel right about coming to church. Who am I to be coming to church? I don't belong. How could I possibly be part of the people of God? I've messed up. I've got it wrong. I've sinned. I'm embarrassed about my life. The benefits of God's grace never depended on the faithfulness of human beings. You are forgiven because of Jesus. You are justified because of Jesus. There's mercy for the messed up. Praise him for his grace and favor to our fathers in distress. Praise him still the same forever. Slow to chide and quick to bless. Father like he tends and spares us well, our feeble frame he knows. In his arms he gently bears us, rescues us from all our foes. Praise him widely as his mercy flows. There's mercy for the messed up. God is greater than our guilt. You can be human before God and be honest with him in prayer in the week ahead about who you are. You can say, this is who I am and I need your help. You don't need to pretend before him. He knows the reality of your life and he loves you. This is a a passage about being human. It's also a passage about being hopeful. Nehemiah doesn't, in this passage, we, we see that there's not a covering over of the cracks. It's not an opportunity to present the best foot forward before God. It's real, it's human, but it's also hopeful. They address God as great and mighty. He's able to do something. He's awesome. He's a God who keeps his covenant. And 
a God of steadfast love. And because they know who it is they're talking to, they ask for only what he can do. They pray for forgiveness. They pray for mercy. And it fills them with hope. Are you, are you hopeful in your prayers? Do you believe that God is able? In a book called You Can Really Grow, the author writes, a year or so ago, a friend at church suggested a way of growing in size so that our little church plant could take advantage of the opportunities we had. He said he thought we should ask for five more people or families to join the church. He thought we should ask for the Lord to do it in a year, even though we just had a couple of people join us in the previous three years. I did not believe it would happen, but I was too ashamed of my lack of belief. So we prayed. I sat with the same friend in a pub near the end of the year, and we counted the five. The exact answer. He told me that he had not believed it would happen, and I admitted the same. Could you be hopeful in your prayer? Your prayer for a neighbor to come to faith. Hopeful in your prayer for the person in your family who doesn't yet know Jesus that you could be tempted to give up praying for? Could you be hopeful in your prayers for Rosemary Presbyterian Church? Could you be hopeful in your prayers for your own spiritual growth that you would get to know God better in 12 months' time, that you would rely on Him more and rely on yourself less? really believe that in all things God is working for your good. Things that you can't see that he's working for your good, but you have to believe. We can be hopeful as we come before Almighty God that he is working all things for our good. Writing about this passage, Matt Capps says this, because of the gospel, when I prayerfully read scripture, I'm able to see that God has been faithful to his people from generation to to generation. And then he says this, because of the gospel, when scripture reads me, I can openly pray and confess my unfaithfulness, knowing that he is faithful to forgive and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Do you know you're forgiven this morning? Do you really believe that you're liberated from your sin because of Jesus? And do you have hope for other people because nobody gets to be with God on the basis of their own behavior? It's all grace. It's all mercy. It's all of Jesus. Therefore, you should have hope for people even though their lives are far from the standard God requires because nobody gets to be with God on the basis of their own behavior. And when you appreciate that yourself, it humbles you. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. And it gives you hope for the people around you. It gives you hope for your church. We instinctively scan our lives trying to work out, why would God love me? Why would God be interested in me? Why would God care for me? What is there about my life that would attract God to me? And that, that's not the way the Bible speaks about how God cares for us, loves us, or is drawn to us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Paul says to the Ephesians, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. You were dead. But God raised you to life. This helps us if we feel uh, jealous of other people and their circumstances. We want to be in their situation or, and we can run them down and can be negative about them. We can become discouraged in our own circumstances and we think that God is paying attention to someone else more than he's paying attention to us and it's simply not true. We can be liberated from 
being competitive, we can be liberated from being annoyed at other people when we realize how well treated we've been by God. We can be mistreated by other people and it doesn't make the biggest impact on our lives. What makes the biggest impact on our lives is how well treated we've been by Jesus Christ. So we can handle the rejection of others. We can handle the mistreatment of others because we've been well treated by Jesus. In this prayer, that God's people pray, the Levites pray, in Nehemiah chapter 9, they say this, verse 33, yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully, and we have acted wickedly. If you're the kind of person that highlights a Bible verse, or writes it out in a journal, or underlines it, or memorizes it, then Nehemiah 9.33 it would be a good verse to highlight, underline, or memorize. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully, and we have acted wickedly. This is who God is. This is the God we come before in prayer and, and humbly and humanly say, this is who we are. And this is the God we come before in prayer and hopefully pray, God, show this same of faithfulness to people who are precious to me that you've shown to me, not because of anything I have done, but because of your own grace. It's good news. You've been righteous in all that you have done. Many years later at the Sea of Galilee, Jesus would open the ears of a deaf man and onlookers would testify about him saying, he has done all things well. And I know that that's a hard statement to make over your life right now. I don't know what it is that you've experienced, what difficulties have come your way. I know in my own life that there have been difficulties and I've, I struggle to think, like, if I was God, I wouldn't have let that happen. I wouldn't have chosen it this way. I wouldn't have allowed that. I wouldn't have permitted this. And yet at some stage in my future, I believe that I will be able to have not only faith to say, Jesus has done all things well, but I will have sight. God will open my eyes look forward to that day when faith becomes sight and I say, Jesus, you've done all things well. But that's our confidence right now. And our confidence is confirmed at the cross, the injustice of the cross when Jesus is nailed to a criminal's cross. Horrendous circumstances. How could that be that Christ is nailed to the cross even though he was perfect, even though he was without sin, that he died in your place, in my place, was buried and rose again. In a book called Truth on Fire, Adam Ramsey says this, in God's hands, even the greatest evil ever committed is bent backwards on itself to accomplish the greatest good. The offer of eternal life for all of us because of this greatest evil God's son murdered on a criminal's cross. And knowing this enables you and I to look at our suffering and our difficult circumstances and believe if God can accomplish the greatest good out of the greatest evil, then what about the suffering and the evil that I'm experiencing now? Is it not possible that God could accomplish good out of that through your cancer diagnosis, through your job uncertainty, through the disappointment in your family, through your financial limitation, through your grief? through the most shameful and embarrassing sin you've ever committed, even in that, there's mercy for the messed up and God's grace is greater than our guilt. He has done all things well and the cross is proof. May you know the love and mercy of Jesus Christ to enable you to be human before him and before others, to be the first to raise your hand and say, yeah, I got it wrong. To be human, but not just to be human and be in despair, but to be hopeful that the faithfulness and mercy of God will actually make a difference. Your hope and my hope doesn't lie in avoiding bad apples. It doesn't lie in paying back all our debts. It doesn't lie in dodging difficulty or suffering because that's impossible. Our hope is found in Jesus Christ. and His mercy is more than our many sins. His grace is greater than all our guilt. May you know him in the week ahead. And may his presence liberate you to be real about who you are and give you hope for your church, for this world, for your neighbors, for your family, and for every person who is precious to you, that you could bring them before him in prayer, saying, you are faithful even though we are fickle. 
May that be an encouragement to each of us this morning. I'm going to take a moment to pray, and then we're going to worship again. Father, we bow before you, giving you thanks that you are the God of mercy. Even though we mess up, you pour out your grace upon us to cover over all our guilt. You're the Savior, the one who deals with our sin and our shame. We thank you for Jesus this morning. Jesus who bore our sins in his body on a tree. We thank you that he died a real death and was raised again to life, demonstrating that he is more powerful than our greatest enemy. We thank you that our hope doesn't lie in our own behavior. We thank you that our hope lies in the perfect life of Jesus Christ. Help us to know him in the week ahead. Help us to be honest with you in our prayers about the reality of our lives and to believe that you love us just as we are. We pray, Lord, that you would make us hopeful about the people all around us, about our neighbors and friends, our work colleagues, our our family members. Make us hopeful for this community and, and hopeful for this, your church. Pray for your blessing upon it so that Jesus Christ would be glorified. Give us courage to to pray big prayers, to be bold enough to ask for growth, for renewal, for change, and believe that you're able to do it. Come and be with us by your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's stand together as we Conclude our worship singing, I, the Lord of Sea and Sky.
a real pleasure to be with you this morning. Thank you for joining with us in worship. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain on you this day and all the days of your life. Amen.